Welcome to Season 2 of the Shopstool Podcast, a podcast for woodworkers and the maker community in general. With Joey Chalk from King Post Timberworks, Brian Cush from Sawdust Bureau, and Robin Lewis from Robin Lewis Makes. Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. This is Episode 21, Season 2 of the Shopstool Podcast. As always, I'm going to start by introducing my two co-hosts. Joey, how's it going? Very good, Robin. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. And Brian, how are you? Very good, Robin. Yourself? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. That's good to hear. And my name is Robin Lewis. Welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, today, we don't have a guest on the show. No. <laughs> it feels like we've become that podcast that interviews people because the last two shows we've been interviewing people. Um, but yeah, it's just the three of us talking today. And we've had a couple of developments, particularly, I think, Joey, Brian, for you guys, because anyone who's listening to the show, it is the 4th of May today, will know that the, the COVID-19 pandemic is starting to, I think, I think for most countries, well, um, a lot of countries, it's starting to shift in the right direction. And Joey, you're back in, in the workshop now, aren't you? Yeah, it's been uh, a crazy five weeks of not knowing anything really. Um, so our government's just lowered the uh, alert level down to three, which means um, pretty much all businesses businesses are allowed back at work as long as you're taking appropriate precautions. Um, so, to, so I guess I'll preface this by saying during the lockdown period, um, my wife and I and anyone we could talk to were kind of um, wargaming out all the different scenarios of what work might look like. Mm. Um, when we come back and trying to just prepare at least for what might happen. And one of what seems to be happening um, is kind of what my, one of my favorite um, ideas were, what would happen is that uh, a lot of work has come in in the last week of the lockdown. It's all work that I had known about clients sitting on fences and not, and just not knowing what they were going to do have now decided to pull the trigger on some jobs um, and I think that's probably just a result of people sitting around in their houses for five weeks and looking at something <laughs> and getting annoyed that hasn't been finished off or whatever so yeah. I think uh, a lot of that's happening so I've got currently I've got um, two kitchens a desk a sideboard I've got a menu board I'm working on right now I've still got my chairs to finish mm. and and it possibly looks like I've got this job for this double set of spiral stairs. So um, that's crazy amounts of work wow. for one guy. What is interesting is that I've had no new inquiries, and that seems to be the general consensus here when I've been talking to all my suppliers and everyone's just soundboarding off everyone else to see what what are your thoughts what's going to happen and what have you heard and it seems like what's happening is everyone's obviously good to be finishing off projects they had started but no one seems to be starting new projects uh, at this stage so in terms of building and renovations the builders are all trying to finish off they've maybe got four to six months worth of work depending on where they were when everything shut down and very little new stuff's happening so um Mm. the kind of prediction at this point is that in three to six months everything's going to really slow down once all these projects are finished off and um, as far as my own circumstances go that seems to be what's happening because I've had zero new inquiries and just dealing with uh, this handful of older clients who who are already kind of in the the system so yeah it'd be interesting to see what happens I'm, I'm stoked to have the work I have on but I'm, and I really need a set of hands or even two sets of hands to get through this. But it's really a tricky decision to make to get my employee back when it looks like it's all just going to fall off a cliff again in a few months. So mm-hmm. uh, really, I don't. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about an extra pair of hands at this point. What are the What are the clients like? I mean, are they quite? Do you think they'd be? quite okay with you taking a bit longer because I guess that yeah, is going to help ex- you out because you can stretch this out as long as possible. Yeah, I have definitely definitely explained that to the clients who I know will be receptive, which is most of them. Um, the one particular client who 
I can see already could be difficult now, and I may just pull my, pull myself out from the job early is this spiral set of stairs where I would be subcontracted out by the main contractor for this new house build and they're already a little bit pushy just getting just trying to get numbers out of me and time frames and, and, and I'm, it's all sounding a little bit like maybe I should just walk away at this point because they're just being a bit unreasonable so um, that's one of those jobs where you don't want to do it because that's an eight week job but um, you know that's a that's that's a that's too much. <laughs> that's a lot of a lot of time paid for in one job, but uh, to have to have to walk away from it, it may may need to happen. So yeah. who knows? Brian, how about you? How's things looking on your end? Things are looking a little bit more positive, um, and kind of different to Joey as well because I've had quite a quiet year and I've. Uh, myself and a few other local makers in Melbourne have kind of associated that with the bushfires and the effect of consumer confidence um, and everybody holding on to their money and then hit by COVID as well. It was like, oh, shit. But um, I've actually found that I've had a flood of inquiries this week, new inquiries, but they've been for smaller pieces. So rather than getting your sort of 10 to 15 grand jobs, there's a flood in around the sort of two to $3,000 sort of smaller, more bespoke pieces. At, at the minute, personally, it actually suits me really well because obviously I'm still adapting to kind of parental life and workshop life and trying to get this, and being able to work on smaller pieces is obviously, it's a bit less crazy for me on, on my body. I don't come home absolutely exhausted. Um, but uh, yeah, at the minute it's been a, again, I don't know how long it's going to last, like whether this is, a result of job keeper payments starting to be paid. So in Australia, every employee that's sort of been furloughed or if you're um, a sole, uh, sole trader, you're entitled to $1,500 a fortnight for up to the next six months that you can prove a 30% reduction in your business. Or I think it's 50% for smaller businesses. So those payments started on Friday and then suddenly over the weekend, I've had four different inquiries that are all going ahead. Um, but like I said, they're all smaller jobs, a um, few built-in pieces. I was, was going to say, if you don't mind me asking, what are they? What are the, the jobs? Uh, two coffee tables, uh, a built-in desk, and a built-in um, like a, a like a media unit. Um, so they're all reasonable jobs, and a few um, a few chefs boards as well. But they came in a batch rather than, you know, just one person asking for them. I had a, a, a client that I did a bit of work for who's a chef and he posted about it on his Instagram. He was doing a, like a Zoom cooking class or something. He posted about it and then people that were doing the cooking class contacted me. So that's good because oh, wow. they're really hard to make any money on if you're doing them sort of one by one. But doing a batch of them at yeah. the minute, again, it, it's it's a small thing that I can have, you know, I can do a bit of work on it and then set it aside and then come back to it and do a bit more. So it's actually a really good project for me to have at the minute. So, yeah, bits and pieces. Um, yeah, like like Joey said, I am a bit nervous about the future and what's coming. Um, but you can only deal with what you've got at the minute. Yeah, because it almost feels like this is the that that calm before the storm yeah. um, as much as it, is, as it is turning around and you know they, they from an economics perspective just in general you know they keep saying that that downturn is potentially coming you know yeah. I've, I've, I've got a fair bit of money in, in stocks and shares and it's not looking good and it hasn't been looking good for a while and it's you know so even though the, the pandemic is we're getting on top of it economically it's still a completely different story I think for, I think smaller makers like one and two person businesses will actually find it a lot easier to survive than the sort of the eight to 12 people businesses I think are really going to struggle for the amount of volumes of work that they require to keep their heads above water. Whereas it's going to be tough, but I think they're probably, I get the feeling that there will be enough work out there to make it worthwhile coming in every day. But um yeah, it might just it, it might just be about um, I don't know. I, I was I was talking to a, a knife maker who's a friend of mine, and I was saying you know maybe I'll design a simpler range of furniture, 
like trying to bring in a coffee table for a thousand dollars made from Australian hardwood that still features a nice bit of detailing in it, but it's not customizable. It's the size. Um, I can cut a whole load of the legs, a whole load of the rails at the same time and just sort of have maybe a set of four of them waiting to go. It's not a huge um, expense outlay for me, but it still allows people to buy a local product without having to absolutely blow the bank. But that's a lot of money to put forward, though, for, on your part. In this, in this turbulent time, do you want to be... Mm, it is and it isn't. Like, it's just about selecting the right timber. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too worried about that, to be honest. But uh, do you, because I know, Joey, you, you, all of your work is, is uh, bespoke from quotes. So there's, you know, there's, um, you, you make nothing unless it's asked for. Brian, do you sell a lot of pieces like that? Changes all the time, Roman. Sometimes I will be like, I could go six months and be 90% bespoke and bigger sort of built-in works. And then the next six months, I could be 90% um, like just my stock range of pieces. Somebody might order a pinch bench and say, uh, I want to change it to Spotted Gum and Vic Ash. And then I've got a cut list and everything's ready to go. Uh, and that's a much more profitable way of working, I find. Okay, so they do move, those, those units. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting because we've talked throughout this this podcast, you know, all the way back into season one. Um, I think Jordan was exactly the same. He was very, very nervous about making pieces that hadn't been quoted. Mm. And you've always been like that, Joe. Yeah, I, I've recently, I've done a lot of trying to, uh, towards the last half of last year, I, I did a lot of work trying to sort out t- to manufacture for a local um, supplier and I did I did crap loads of hours trying to work out exactly I mean because this guy's just on me for price cheaper 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 and I'm like well okay yeah but okay quality 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 is going down a, a little bit here but I mean that's obviously beside the point um, I I find and I've done it with my chairs um, remember I made my crown chairs a while back and I ended up only ever making 12 of them six for me and six got sold and um no like uh, the amount of time it takes to develop a product and to get it to the point where it's economical economical to make and is you know, time efficient there's a shitload of time in that and then to not know what the what the outcome is going to be orders wise is, is so tough and uh, to me I mean, if I could do that, I think I would go down that road and have some line a bit like Brian. But at the end of the day, it's just never worked for me. I've done it on, tried it on several different types of things and had no inquiries. And um, because even then, the price just isn't anywhere near what you're finding in these furniture stores where it's all imported stuff. And people don't, uh, certainly people didn't care at all that it was New Zealand made. And now... It's becoming more of a people are promoting it. You must be getting the same kind of um, promotion type things in Australia, where people are. It's generally being accepted that we have to support local businesses. That everyone needs to kind of chip in, and if you're going to buy something, then try buying it Australian made or New Zealand made. Um, Certainly now, it would be very popular. I think. Yeah, no, so I mean, think, especially yeah. trying to get stuff exported from from China, India, Indonesia in the next year is going to be so hard like the people that are ordering like sofas that you know are usually prepared to wait 12 weeks for a sofa are now going to be waiting what six months 12 12 months yeah yeah um so i think there are opportunities there um obviously we're kind of fortunate because we're we're in a bigger consumer market than new zealand and then you look to people that are in europe or the states and they're bigger again but um yeah i think like for me, when I'm design, when, when I'm talking about designing a cheaper range of pieces, I think it's just about being really selective about the types of details that you're adding enough that it's not something you'd see in a furniture store, and whether that's a bit of exposed joinery or just mm-hmm. something really small yeah. that that person can say that was made in Australia by a person who has an eye for design. Um, but I know what you mean. It is yeah. It's always swimming but, against the current and trying to yeah. But the two of the pieces of work I've got to just come through uh, from a, a client I did some little piece for something I didn't even even know what it was um, 
she came back to me with this list of like 12 different pieces of furniture and said, you know, we're just about to move into the new house. This was all just about to be ordered from China, obviously at a, at a Chinese price point. But now we, we're not, we, we don't want to give them the money because we have no idea how long it's going to take and even if it will get to us. Can you price like these two items? And we'll see, because we really want the desk and we really want the sideboard. So I've got those two jobs and she's just not going to buy the other kind of house load of stuff. She's just going for the two pieces that are made, going to be made a lot more, um, you know, with a lot more care and get a really nice end product. And she's decided to, you know, go without the other things that she doesn't need so much. So, And she's okay it. with the price because presumably it's going to be more expensive. Well, it's quite a lot more from what I from what I gather. Um, that's why she's not getting everything she wanted. She's just getting ah, two okay. other pieces. Yeah, gotcha. So as opposed to getting twelve pieces, she's getting two. So yeah. well, that's exactly that's the, the price point is. That's exactly the consumer mentality that we need people to adopt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, buying yeah, less, absolutely. buying quality, looking local yeah. rather than importing. And um, so hopefully, hopefully more people think like she does. Yeah, it's interesting. I got one other call from asking for the similar thing. And so this lady sent me this desk, kind of a fold-up desk thing. I've never really seen it before. And she said, can you make this? I'm wanting to buy it, but if I can get it made lo locally. So this also comes up to the, comes with it, the conversation of just straight out copying other people's work. Because she's like, I want this thing, which it turns out I didn't know it was an IKEA product. Um, we don't have IKEA only just got it here so like I have no idea what they even have um, so she sent me the link and I said yeah I can make that but there's no way I can make it for the price that was on the website um, and she came back and said no I want you to price it because I want to buy New Zealand made so I priced <laughs> it up drew it up and um, it was double the price of the Ikea one almost that's exactly pretty good. double that's the pretty good to even price. get double the price well yeah and I actually said to a the bonus is here, I've got to buy two whole sheets of plywood. So you can make this thing as big as you like. The price is going to be the same. The materials is what killing us here. And um, she ended up saying, well, no, it's actually too much. I don't want to pay double. I just, I, I'm not that keen on being New Zealand made. I was just wanting to pay like 10% <laughs> extra or something, that, you know? Yeah, the like, truth comes so, out. How patriot, yeah. patriotic are you really here? Yeah. <laughs> and um, besides, besides that, I wasn't that comfortable with just straight up copying this idea that had dubious joinery methods anyway and I was like mm. so yeah it's an interesting interesting point because I'm sure that's going to happen too people are going to say I want this but I can only get it in America why don't you copy it for me and you're like well okay what do you do there do you want work do you want to do you want to have to copy this thing I mean it throws up a whole lot of ethical issues which makes your life complicated <laughs> with these pieces that you're doing Brian is there anything particularly interesting that you, you I mean are you getting to experiment on them at all uh, the console table that I'm working on at the minute um, was one that I had designed pre the COVID outbreak the one that I had a sketch on my Instagram sort of it's like a two tier thing with a built in drawer in it I'm pretty excited about that I've, I've got the framing um, cut up and some of the joinery done there's one tricky bit that I'm trying to work out today but yeah that's that's pretty fun um, the other one is a coffee table that I'm collaborating with um, an artist who does work in basalt. Um, design yet to be confirmed, but uh, he's managed to create like a liquid basalt that you can wow. mold. Um, oh, and cool. I've, I've got to try to find a way of incorporating that into timber and dealing with expansion and contraction around around a stone. It's going to be pretty interesting. If it's, um, if it's liquid... There must be some kind of uh, resin-based... Yeah. yeah, it's got a resin so, in yeah. it and powder, um, but it's... You think, I think it'd be it's, fairly stable, huh? Yeah, I just don't know how much it's going to... Like, when you're com comparing it to timber contraction, um, whether it's going to sort of... If it's a large piece, whether it's then going to split the timber as it's trying to contract onto the, onto the stone. But um, I don't know. We're trying to work out the idea of whether it's going to be an inlay or whether it's going to be more of a structural... You know, like the concrete mm. leg on my pinch bench, like something solid, or whether it's something finer in the in the piece. Something I've always wanted to do and never had, whatever the time, money, everything else, is make a piece that so it could be a fairly straightforward, say, coffee table, 
but it transitions from one end to the other. It transitions in materials. Mm-hmm. So it might start in stone, and then it just slowly it weaves and becomes timber at the other end. Yep. Um, and as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, that would be that would be what you use. So you make a mold and form up this half of it in stone, and then like key in. Uh, you can have the stone in such a shape that it like kind of dovetails itself into mm. the timber and, and it yeah. just a jigsaw yeah it, it jigsaws in together which would be kind of an interesting idea but yeah so it's funny you say that yeah that's <laughs> that was one that's of the directions um yeah. i yeah. saw a similar it. piece go, go in um in japan in kyoto outside the castle uh they have a, a similar i don't know what the stone was but it, it was the same thing it had these dovetails cut into it the timber yeah, cool. was thought into it. it was amazing um that's cool. But yeah, we're just not quite sure whether it's going to be like yeah, quite a fine inlay or, or a more chunky mm. sort of monolithic kind of thing. But um, it's a fun fun piece to work on. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that sounds like something our our mate Neil would be working on with his. Um, yeah. What was he talking about it at uh, with the liquid? Was it liquid ti- liquid titanium? Oh uh, Prob- yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. In his lab. That's Where amazing, they... hey. Him with that uh that dreamliner. Fantastic, yeah. Can you believe it was in so, the New yeah. Zealand press? Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw it. I was like, that is outrageous. Well I thought it was interesting it didn't really talk about him very much yeah. actually organizing it. It talked yeah. about all the other kind of knock on effects, but not much about there's one guy deci- decided to just do it. Yeah. I think Boeing <laughs> are able to scream a bit louder in an interview for mentions than uh, yeah. than Neil can. But yeah, it was it was pretty amusing in the the America the first American articles that appeared on it. The decimal place in the number of masks was sort of shifted a little bit. <laughs> it went from one point really? five million masks to fifteen million masks. Oh my god! <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> what's what's thirteen and a half million between friends? <laughs> but um, yeah, fair play to him. And that, like, thanks again to him and Burn for coming on. It was it's really nice to mm. just chat to some other makers and see how they're going during this whole shamozzle. Yeah, we were talking just before we started the show, um, and we were looking at the numbers in terms of the, I guess where the interest has lied in our last maybe ten or twenty shows, and there was definitely a lot more interest around the the interview with Neil and and burn i mean the numbers for burn are still a bit early at this stage but i'm sure they will they look like they're going that way so i think this is something that we might look into a lot more i mean we've always wanted to do it this season but it's definitely something that people are interested in so we will look to try and get some some more interesting guests on the show yes because we're so boring (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so robin you're making a crazy crazy thing a roundy, yeah. stripy zebra table. It's is that the yeah, official name? The stripy zebra table. <laughs> that's a, that's a, I should I should use that. That it work quite well. Um, yeah, it's it's coming on pretty well. I had a bit of a a bit of a, a wobble yesterday. So for for anyone who hasn't been following along on Instagram, I've taken a, a, a circle table and. It's the inside, if you, if, you, if you try and picture it, the inside piece is like a big oval, and then there's 10 curved steam bent strips on either side radiating outwards. So that's the blank, and then I'm going to cut a circle out of that. Uh-huh. So up until now, I've been working with the steam bent strips, which are still pretty, there's, there's very little, um, it's, it's, it, they're all over the place in terms of their shape and their thickness and that. There's no structure to them at, at this point. So the last couple of days I've been flattening the piece. So whenever I've worked with this, the steam bending stuff and flattening with the router jig in the past, it's always been a case of you, you, you get your blank to 40 mil to thickness it down to 20 mil because there's always going to be so much play. You've got to allow for that. And I was hoping for this table to be at around 28 to 30 mil final thickness. And after I started gluing up the, or sorry, my, my strips for the steam bending were at 30. Right. I then started gluing them and they were all over the place. So I knew I was yeah. going to lose a whole bit of it. <laughs> yeah. And yesterday I made, I don't know how, but I made this massive stuff up while I was doing the, the, the flattening with the router jig. On one end of the table, it was at 26 mil. And on the other end, it was 22 
don't know how I did that. So the I had bit to, slipping in your in the router. I don't know. Maybe the you know because I'm using a little trim router, it's going to get re- it gets really hot, really really hot. So I don't know if the but surely not four mil. I mean, it, the, the bit's not going to expand the. No, but it could slip no, in the collet. Over the collet, yeah. Especially yeah. if it's getting hot and the collet's expanding, the bit can just be dropping down as you go along. Could be. Because it's not, it's, it's, I don't, really don't think this little trim router is designed for it. No. Um, so on the next pass, before I took it off, I tightened the, the collet down a little bit more. And I now have a 22 mil tabletop, right. which, is, which is what I've ended up with. Actually, looking at it, though, it's, I actually don't mind it. It's going to be a bit more elegant. Yeah. Yep. Than, you know, having something really chunky. Thin but top is fine. I mean, presumably you've got an idea for the base anyway, and you can allow for it to be held as flat as possible. Yeah, so it's, the base is going to be pretty simple, just like a... I mean, it's, it's nothing extravagant, but it's going to be a bit of a half-flap cross. You've probably seen it before. Um, you know, so it's going to have four or well, two cross pieces keeping the table down, keeping it flat. Yeah. And, yeah, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. Into, it's certainly not strength. Um, and, you know, uh, with movement, yeah, the, the, the leg assembly should hold it in place. So but, yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. The shape of your top, because when you, we, well, I haven't obviously seen it since you've trimmed it or whatever. I just saw all your strips glued to your center blanks. And the shape is not semicircular that is more of a kind of an eye ellipse shape so yeah yeah right right yeah so when you cut a circle out of that your the the edge of the circle radius is going to be different to the radius on the laminations so you're still going to have any an ellipse type shape inside of a circular table is inside that right of a circle yeah that's it yeah and did you want that or were you aim would did you would you have preferred to have like the same kind of radius as the well, this is, it's funny, this, this ties in with what we talked about a while ago, Brian, about having a, having a design and an idea and a purpose and a bit of an intent to what you're building, and then you do that. You, you go with that. And we talked about this a couple months ago. And my original goal for this table was to have uh, concentric circles of timber running around and that was that was the original goal that's what i messaged you guys and said from a yeah. movement perspective is this thing just going to explode itself apart <laughs> if yeah. i do that so then the next best thing was to go with these very gentle you know a, mm. a centerpiece with the gentle circles so the problem is that was the plan b and i looked at the table yesterday and i went this is interesting. I would never design this. Like, I would, right. I would never think this is what I'm going to build. So I've shifted so far from the original plan that this is where I've ended up. I don't think it's, I don't think it's ugly. I mean, I don't think it's hideous. But it's certainly not something that you would go, that's what I want. That's the table mm. that I want. Now, I've been trying, to, I've been trying to think about what it's going to look like. And I think I, I like the idea of having two random kind of orbits. You're, you're, seeing, you're seeing two kind of circular shapes that will be possibly i imagine complementary but completely different with their radius and i think that will be interesting to look at two circular forms on a flat surface like that of course i haven't seen it yet but yeah i I find like i would never have designed that either because it seems counterintuitive yeah so i had thought about moving the center points out to the side uh, that's what I was yeah. just about to say I was like because yeah. if you don't get the center point exactly right or if your curve is slightly off it's just going to be that slight trick of the eye that you're going to your brain's going to because they're contrasting Make it timbers asymmetry. as well yeah. your, your eye's going to see it really quickly but yeah if you move it off center and have it doing something a bit quirkier it might that's, a, that's might really work. interesting actually yeah so I've cut the I've cut it about, at the moment, just with the flattening process, I cut it, all the material down just so I wasn't flattening more than it needed to. So I've probably got about 100 mil that I can actually do the, move the final circle within right. the blank. Yeah, and I might think about that. I mean, I've, I've, I've drawn the circle with the center point, and to my eye, it looks good. You know, the, where, it's, where the circle meets the outer strips, mm-hmm. like the, the, the spacing there is all right, so I don't think it'll... I don't think it'll be a problem, but yeah, I, I yeah, maybe it'll just give it a bit more interest than just being, yeah, 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's gonna that'll be one of those annoyingly uh, hard decisions to make where you're just looking at it for weeks and then finally you start cutting into it and then it's, it's done. <laughs> and it's got it's it's either one or the other. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I would do, Robin? I would get a big sheet of cardboard and cut mm, the circle up. negative from it and just sort of shift it around and that's play a with idea. a few patterns rather than just sketching it and seeing how it would look. I would actually use it as like a silhouette to give you an idea of what the finished piece that's would look like. Really it's a really good idea, yeah. Yeah. Because I've drawn Absolutely. the circle on it, but you can't really get the same feel for no. it. Yeah. Mm. Or, yeah. Or even if you just mask and taped it off, if you didn't yeah. have a big enough piece of cardboard or whatever, yeah. mask off all the area you don't want to see and, and just shift that point a little and see what that's like. I've, have you been to any timber yards, Joey? Have you noticed any any lack of stock or supply issues that you're in? I, I think I remember no. you saying you were getting plywood. Like, it's still... Obviously, because they haven't been shipping any plywood out in the last few weeks, are you slightly concerned that there might be a dip yeah? In there's supply? definitely. I think there's definitely going to be a supply from my like kitchen plywood supplier who do yeah. like pre-finished panels, and I I know that they're not. They've got a, the biggest warehouse you've ever seen full of plywood, but when the stock, the popular stock runs out, that runs out. So um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm good for that because I can adapt really easily. I can make kitchens out of anything, and I have done. Yeah. But um, I think people who are just using like white melamine type board and it runs out, that they'll have issues. But yeah, yeah. I was wondering the same thing with finishes. I stocked up a bit on uh, on Osmo the other week. Yeah. Right. Just. I just bought some for the first time. It's awesome. For the first time. <laughs> yeah, because we I you couldn't can't get it here. Right. Um, it was very difficult, and then finally I found an uh, Osmo certified supplier, whatever, and they've just changed their name slightly to operate in New Zealand, and um, but they have a full Osmo product list, so I just bought some graphite stuff to do some kind of uh, aged type effect for some client, but it's really easy to... Do you want to name drop the supplier for the, the Kiwi listeners there? Can you remember who it is? <sighs> No, I don't no, remember who it is. That's all right. They can Google it. But it's good, yeah, it's it's good like, that it's, it's finally so, available there. It's like New Zealand natural oil or something like that. Okay. Um, and, I'm, and have you I, used it? Have you, yeah, have you I just, it? Yeah, just, I've just made up a sample with it, and it's um, just rag it on, it's finished. <laughs> it's just, it, it's just it, like so, Danish oil. So. Is it that easy? Is yeah. It? And, and especially with the stained one, because I got the, a graphite one, which is like a kind of dark, dark oaky brown, and, um, and that's an anytime you're putting a stain on a blonde timber it's a pain in the ass but mm. this stuff you can just just buff, buff it in until it's even and it's so easy did you grain fill the timber before? no no you didn't I don't okay. I don't I've never grain filled anything mm. <laughs> um, just whack it on especially mm. if I'm doing rustic type finish you want that you want that depth of grain yeah. you want the, the stain to stay in deep in there yeah and then sand it off and then it looks like it's been in the mud and stuff yep yeah when when you are when you are uh, quoting with a client and you're talking about stain, do you ever suggest to the client that they go for the stain route, or is it always on their request? Um. So, for example, this set, this desk that I've got coming up, to, and she sent me these pictures of what the Chinese furniture was going to look like, and it's some kind of Chinese oak and then they've thrown on a stain and then kind of a, a whitewash on top of that and kind of rubbed it all back. So it's that kind of, I don't even know what to call that style, aged dish, kind of weathered a little weathered, bit. Weathered, that's the one, yeah. Um, so if someone comes to me with that kind of look, I'm like, okay, well, we're going to get some cheaper timber, probably ash, and then throw some dark stain on it, throw some light yeah. stain on it. It's going to look pretty similar. Generally, I say, if you want a really dark finish, let's just buy a really dark wood because mm. um, then you actually get to see the wood and not the stain. Um, but because people will often say, oh, but it's cheaper to buy, like, pine, That's and then we I just ask. put a stain on it, and it looks like walnut. It's like, no, that is never going to happen. It doesn't uh, look like especially, walnut, and it requires a hell of a lot more labor yeah, as well. Yeah, especially yeah. pine. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm okay staining ash. American white ash is a nice hardwood. It looks very much like oak. Put a stain on it, it looks like oak. You take 
you take a softwood like pine and try and put a stain on it for, for a start it's going to look absolute rubbish and blotchy and terrible and you have to do a whole lot more work toning it and matching your stains and, and getting an even finish which is a whole art form which I'm not even that good at yeah. and then you've got to finish that and and you try sanding clear coats between coats and not take the stain off on the corners and stuff like that. I mean, it's an absolute nightmare to do it on softwoods. And um, so I really try just to say, look, you got to spend a bit more money here. Use at least, at least you got to use some hardwood, or it's yeah. just not something that you can have because you can't afford it. Because like it's just going to look terrible if we do this in a, in a cheap timber. And that's, that's, that's why it is cheap. <laughs> that's sort of why I ask, because as probably the, the, the youngest woodworker out of the three of us, I still remember in the early days going for pine, Cabot's walnut stain, putting this on going, oh, this looks nothing yeah. like what I would expect <laughs> walnut to look. This yeah. makes no sense. Um, and that's why I asked. They're like, it's, it's, a stained timber is a stained timber. It's yeah. not the timber that it's matching. It's just there. Like people, I think people get it. There's a misconception where people say, "Oh, I'm going to buy walnut stain." It's not going to make your timber look like walnut. It's generally toned to look like a general tone mm. of walnut that they happen to color. have in the factory the day that they made the stain. Yeah. Like um, stain is there to kind of tone out and generally even out the natural variations in timber color that you have. Um, I would go as far as saying that like the, like if you've got mahogany and you want to enrich in it and make it look deeper you'd put like my mahogany stain on mahogany and like mm. enrich in it even out the tone over that timber rather than try and turn a piece of whatever you've got maple into mahogany it's never going to happen it's just going to turn pink so <laughs> yeah. yeah um it's 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 uh it's not really what the majority of like DIYers think stain is. It's not yeah. designed to make cheap look expensive. It's designed to highlight the natural beauty in that kind of timber and highlight the grain structure. It's, not, it's nothing to do with hiding it. You know, otherwise, you use paint. I definitely be with, with Joey on that. I, if, if a client wants a, a dark piece, I might use a dark timber. The, mm-hmm. the two exceptions, um, or the three exceptions I'll make with stain is I'll stain things black, like using dyes. Yeah because yep. I don't think you're trying to mimic another timber yep. or soap washing yep. or whitewashing timber, the same thing. You're not trying to make it look like something it's not. Like, it's just, it, yeah, it's just... Highlighting it. Highlighting it, yeah. And there's no expectation that the client would assume that they're going to get that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other one is the toning um, that Joey's talking about. Like, if I, for example, the dresser unit that I've just finished that had the finger pulls cut on the angle, so there's quite a deep reveal on it. Mm. And they're solid timber fronts. When I cut into one of the reveals, it, uh, I don't know, it was, I think it was heartwood, and it went very pink. Oh, so yeah. it's this beautiful blown piece, and then there's a pink strip across it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at it for a few days, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get the stain out. So the yeah. same thing, it was just mixing a few different tones of stain together, testing it on a corner, putting a bit of Osmo over the top of it, seeing how it looked, and just toning it out just to smooth it out yeah. so again you're not telling it to be something it's it's not it is the timber but you're trying to get it just to blend across the piece mm-hmm. a bit better yeah yeah that's something in woodworking that i have been pretty neglectful of in the past like something i've, I've like i made this cool thing and i've finished sanding it now i'm just going to put clear coat on it and walk away and it's finished and I, and it's really not the right approach i really have started to think a lot more in terms of actually what is the clear coat going to do when you know and now i know a bit more about what's what if the color changes that piece of wood's a bit more sappy it's probably going to end up with a completely different color to the board next mm. to it do i need to do something about toning that and it's a pain in the ass when you do because it's a lot more work yeah it's yeah. it all just comes down to design intentions as mm. well and expectations of the client like if you're doing this 15 meter long table that's you know a meter wide i think it's absolutely fine to see all this variation through it but in a small piece if you have this big contrasting (laughs) strip of color that's what your eye gets drawn to it's not the way the piece is designed it's like so yeah sometimes it will uh it will just bug me to the point of insanity and this was one of those cases yeah to fix it 
we've got a guy here in Townsville. He's called the Pallet Punter, and uh, he <laughs> makes furniture out of pallets. And yeah. he's uh, on his Instagram uh, feed. He was staining some of the the pallet timber, and this particular client just wanted it slightly darker. <laughs> And it was, oh, no, 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 it, it's, it's not a funny story. Like, it, it goes in the, <laughs> it worked out all right. But it, <laughs> I, can, I know what you're thinking. Like, yeah. you put on black and it just, uh, he just took, like, it was like a, a, a yellowy orange color. And he just t- took the, the, the piece and just made it ever so slightly darker. And it looked so good. But it was the, it was the gentlest staining yeah. I've ever seen. And, and that looked really nice. Well, good on him for being able to do it because I always tell clients, often people, a lot of times people want birch plywood, but they'll say to me, oh, let's just go a shade darker. And I'm like, that is the most difficult thing to do. One, you're talking about a very blonde timber. And as soon as I rub some stain on it and come back for the next pass, you've got a double layer out. It's going to soak it in a different rate. It's instant blotchy. It's going to be terrible. And, And then... On top of that, adding the difficulty of staining just a very light color. It, it's so hard and so easy to get blotches and, and double, triple thicknesses of stain. Um, and uh, that's why I say if you're going to stain it, let's go, like uh, Brian said, let's go black, really dark mm-hmm. brown, um, or leave it as is. Yeah. Did you find the, I know you were trying to sort of create a more of a rustic look but did you find the, the Osmo product that has the tint in it an easier process than like would you feel confident to use something like that on birch yeah uh, yeah I um, would and I have done I've used in the, so my solution to that whole problem with staining birch in the past is I've told clients to, we, we will use one of the Cabot's stain and varnish pre-mixed combos because it's got the, the finish already mixed into it it's, it's way more accepting to, to being um, finessed and you can run over it a few times and, and smooth it out and it doesn't, the stain just doesn't instantly soak in, which is the problem with most stains. Mm. And so the Osmo is exactly the same where you've got a good amount of time to buff it and rub it out and um, even out the, the color. It's yeah, really easy. My, my first staining experience was with the water-based um, varnish stain <laughs> which was just a disaster because you know we've talked about in the past how water-based poly is so finicky on that first time because it hits the wood and it starts drying and now you put a stain into it and yeah it couldn't have been more blotchy i don't think yeah right. <laughs> that's interesting all right well i reckon we'll we'll leave it there for today it's it's so awesome to hear that you guys that you know from a business perspective a that you're back in it because it you know i remember when we talked about it what that would have been a couple months ago it yeah. just it just felt like the clouds were coming in <laughs> yeah. the walls were ca- caving yeah. in it just felt awful so yeah. I didn't think we'd be here so soon no it's good let's just cross fingers that it's it gets better from here it doesn't get worse yep fingers crossed So to everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please go ahead and give it a rating on iTunes. It really does help us out. Shop Still Podcast is available on iTunes and most other podcast apps. My name is Robin Lewis. Joey and Brian, thanks very much for hanging out today. Take care, everyone, and we will see you in the next show. See ya. All the best, guys.